Good morning, everyone, and welcome to week two of Art Starts Explores Maps. My name is Kay Slater, and I'm making with you for the second week in a row as we explore maps together. Uh, last week, we explored maps as it related to building a fantasy world. Um, so whether that is at the start of a story that you're writing as a tool to help you plan a story, a map that could be the base of a board game, or just a, a fun exercise where you get to imagine um, and create a fantasy world based on the different terrains that you put down. So that was a lot of fun. If you missed last week and you want to go back and check it out, you can check out all of our previous explorers online at artstarts.com slash explorers dash online on our YouTube channel or on Facebook. Okay, so for this week of exploring maps, I thought we could uh, we could play we could play some games. Um, and so, before we get started, I want you to see if you have if you want to follow along. If you just want to watch, that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to be using some paper, um, and this could be any paper. It doesn't have to be nice uh, new paper. It can be any paper that you find. I love going to the recycling bin and finding paper. This is the back of an envelope, a big white envelope. There's an address on the front and I ripped it up into pieces because here's some nice white paper. Uh, this looks like it, it's got a watermark on it from, from a company. So this came in the mail. Oh, and then I do have a piece of printer paper that just happened to be in the recycling bin. And it was all, it was all ready to go. It was all good. So, uh, um, I'm glad I went into the recycling bin and found it. Then uh, some mark making tools, and that can be anything. That could be pencils, that could be um, pens, that could be markers, that could be uh, crayons, anything that makes a mark. Um, at Explorers, I always tend to use markers because it shows up better um, on the video. It has a higher contrast, but you certainly don't have to use markers. You can use whatever mark making tool you want. Um, so I have suggested uh, this so you can see the dotted line here. This is just suggested. This is just in case you have them around. Um, ready made. So last week I pulled out some tokens that I had that can be really fun when you're making maps. Um, if you want to use these to mark out spaces on a map. Um, and then some scissors if you're not as into ripping paper as I am because I love ripping paper then uh, having a pair of scissors handy might be something that you want to have. But as I was getting ready, as I was putting out my stickies, I was just thinking that one of the other tools that we, would be really great to have on hand this week would be one of my favorite tools, and that is your viewfinder. And so if you've been making with me since uh, basically spring of last year of 2020, um, you may have seen my episode, the first episode we ever did called Framing, where we made our own viewfinders. And so if you have your own viewfinder handy, I recommend that you get it um, for today's session. Ooh, sorry, I dropped something off camera. Um, and one of the viewfinders that I made had a grid and it had some string across that divided it up. So if you wanted to grab your viewfinder today, uh, I thought that would also be something um, that you could use. Okay, I'm going to put those to the side. I'm also going to put my stickies to the side so we have a little bit more making space. Again, <laughs> this curly little <laughs> sticky this week. That's okay if it comes off. All right, so I was thinking what we could do to start is that we could look at mapping a space. And so what I'm talking about for that is that when we translate um, a real space onto a piece of paper, we're mapping a space, right? We're creating a, a 2D representation of a real place. And this can be really fun um, for building a game, for making a secret code for friends or with friends or family. Um, it could be to give somebody a reference when you want to build um, a chore map. So you could divide up um, your classroom or your grandparents' house 
or your foster home into sections and then every person that is there at the time when it's chore time, they could take that section of the house. Or maybe it's Easter time and you've hidden chocolate eggs around the house and you want to make a mark or make a map so you can remember so that if everybody else goes out and tries to find the chocolate eggs, you know that they were all found and where they were and you can go check afterwards. So mapping a real life space can be, um, can be a fun thing to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a really quick map of the first floor of my studio. But if you have a piece of paper, wherever you're making today, even if it's not someplace that you're going to come back to, take a second and look around where you're sitting or watching right now. The first thing we want to do is we want to consider that this, this, uh, whatever size paper you have, and, and you know what, I'm going to take one of these because it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a nice piece of paper. It doesn't have to have nice clean edges. Nothing that we're making today is for keeps. And so find, find a shape, imaginary shape on this page that is, is basically the outline or the furthest edges of the space you're making or the face, space you're mapping. Now for me, the space that I'm mapping is very rectangular. And so it's very easy for me to go this is basically the first floor of my studio. But the place where you're making may be a L shape. It could be a circle. It could have a whole bunch of different squares. And that's okay. But for me, I have uh, I have a pretty wide open space. And there's actually only one wall that comes out over here. And then there's a set of stairs that I have that go up. And this is me uh, defining the areas. So um, if you had, let's say you had um, a kitchen or a bedroom or a closet in your classroom or um, again, just a wall that comes out in a place and divides an area. This allows us to get an idea of the space of, of the map that we're creating. And because this, is, this isn't for keeps and we're just trying it out, the first time you draw your outline, you might make a certain area of wherever you're mapping really too big in reference or compared to the other spaces. And so maybe uh, the first time I was doing this, maybe I would draw my stairs that you know, come to halfway across my space. And then when I was starting to map and draw other details, I would go, oh no, I don't have enough space um, beside my stairs for all the things that are actually there. And that would be okay. If you were using something that you could erase, you could erase it, or you could grab another piece of scrap paper, or you could take other sections of ripped paper and you could just put it on top of, uh, of the place where you already drew and then make a new section. There you go, and move it around, right? And if it, there, if I needed to cover more and the, the new place that I drew wasn't enough, there, I've covered it, and now I can go, nope, that's where the, that's where the wall is supposed to be, or that's where the wall is supposed to be. You could start by just doing the outlines and do all the different places that you observe in your in your space on ripped pieces of paper and then you could move them around right if you're not really sure that would that would allow you to then come back afterwards and draw once you place them i'm going to take some more of my ripped paper there we go and then maybe uh, i can draw my stairs Ooh, paper's moving around and i draw my stairs smaller and I go, okay, where are the stairs supposed to be? Are they supposed to be here? Are they supposed to be there? And then maybe I've got a cabinet or cupboard. Where's that supposed to go? Is it there? Is it there? And you can move it around. 
So that's one way you could do it. You can draw it right directly on, and I'm going to do that. But that would be a really great way for you to be able to move it around and figure it out before you draw it direct on the page. This would also be fun if you had um, if you had a place where you were going to sleep and you or sort of a bedroom um, or a dorm room or a space where you get to keep your stuff and you want to try and design that space um, and you're not really sure where you want things to go. Well, before you have to um, move your heavy bed or before you have to ask a friend or a family member or a grown up to come and help you move things around, you could draw all the large furniture in your space to begin with and then you could move it around to see how you liked the layout and then you've got a plan you've got a map and then the the, the friends or the grown-ups that you have um, who are going to help you after you can be like okay everyone this is our plan this is our map this is what we're going to do um, and you could show them the dresser might be right here right now but i want it to go over to this side of the room um, and because there's only so much space here, we have to plan that this really big, let's pretend that's a bookshelf, this really big bookshelf has to be moved after because um, if it's over here, there's not enough space for us to move our bookshelf in here. So yeah, we have to move my dresser first and then we can move my new bookshelf into this space. And so that's another really great reason why you would use all these scrap pieces of paper um, if you were mapping the space for that reason. But I'm going to just draw, I'm going to draw a quick map of my space. And you can do, you can do the same thing for you too. So I'm going to turn off my voice for a second while I look around my space, because it's hard to draw and talk at the same time. Um, so I'm going to do some deep looking around my space and I'm going to draw uh, a few different things. If you're still drawing your space out, you can keep going. You don't have to look up or pay attention to what I drew. Um, and if you're just drawing a made up space, that's okay as well. You don't have to draw any place in particular. Um, but what we're trying to do right now is to use our skills of looking and observing around a space and seeing how much information we can translate and um, thinking about the space of how big things are in relation to other things and kind of plan those things out um, so that we don't have things that are way too big um, and then not really have room for other things. So th this is a skill. It takes a while. We have to practice this multiple times. And even though I have drawn my studio before like this, there are still some things that I drew a little too big and a little too small. So it, it's, it is a difficult thing to do. So don't worry. Um, if you if you didn't do it perfect or if you even uh, ran out of space, that's okay. We're just practicing. It's not for keeps. So um, for me, the funniest thing that I noticed was this is my washroom over here and I have a washing machine outside beside it. And my washing machine ended up being really huge. My bathtub ended up being too small. And then I barely had enough room for my toilet and my sink. And then my door that I drew way too big, I've got a cupboard blocking my doorway right now. 
that's okay. I can just laugh at it that, that it, didn't, it didn't work that well. But because I didn't have um, the right size here, it ended up squishing up other things. And that would be a cool time for me to use my scrap paper, come in here again and go, no, actually the washing machine should probably be that big. The washroom should be that big. The tub is only that big. Draw all the different details in here first before adding my little door. There we go, and I have a cupboard over here. There we go, that is much more accurate. But I had to practice it first. There we go, here I'm gonna show you at the side. By noticing and trying it the first time, I realized that it made more sense for me to draw the, uh, the bathroom way bigger. And then whatever space I had left over, that's where I would do the wash, the, the, my washer, my clothes, my clothes washer. I'm just gonna put that over top, because that's great. Here, I'm gonna show the walls there, perfect. You wouldn't even know. <laughs> you wouldn't even know that I had to, to redraw it. Okay. So um, what, what do you notice about the drawing that you just did? Or what do you notice about the drawing that I just did? Well, the first thing that I notice is that even though I didn't say it, I just, I just instinctively or I just knew without having to say it out loud or to be told to begin with, that it would be easiest for me to draw this map based on something called a bird's eye view. And what that means is as if you were a bird that was flying up high and seeing your space from, from high up, from the top down. And that's what they mean when they say bird's eye. And if you think about maps, um, you know, like road maps, that you've seen before, if you've ever seen one of these before. We're not seeing a map. Oh, this is a real big one. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna unwrap the whole thing so we can look at it. Ooh. Okay, so this is a map of, uh, of unseated Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish territory in so-called Vancouver. Um, and so this is a road map. So if you were driving around, right, and you needed to, to find somewhere, well, these are, this is all bird's eye, right? So that we can see the streets because if we had to draw it so that we were, uh, as if we were walking along, we have to draw the buildings at the side. Um, and when we look at the side of something, right, how do you, how do you um, express behind a, behind a building, the road, if you're, if you're drawing your building as if what you're seeing um, is here. I'll show you on another page. But so when we are mapping a space, what we're trying to do is get the most information possible onto the flat uh, 2D drawing. And so hallways or um, pathways, so uh, places that you walk in your space or in your classroom. If you're gonna draw all the desks, in your classroom, you'd probably just want to draw the tops of the desks because if you put the full desk on its side, it would take up way more space and you'd probably lose the space uh, where you can walk in between. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about, but I wanted to show you that um, a, a road map is a bird's eye view. So when you see all the roads here, it's as if you were flying like a bird above a map. Most people these days don't even use the paper maps. They usually just use their phones um, or their computers to use um, one of the digital maps um, online. Um, but you may actually have a copy of one of these um, in, your, in your classroom or wherever you're making today. And you can ask a, a grown up if they have a copy of one of these. I just moved it over to the side because folding up maps can be can be a challenge and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that on my own time a little later. Okay, so what I was talking about there, and you should try this out as well. You should try this out um, on one of your own pieces of paper. What would it look like if you didn't draw a bird's eye view of your space? Or think about your, your classroom or the last time you were in a classroom, right? If you weren't going to draw, and what I was suggesting before was, so if there were a bunch of desks that you would draw, maybe you've got uh, a row of four, and then you've got uh, the 
desks maybe go back five. So this is the same as before. Oh, whoop, five, I said. Okay, so maybe those are your desks and then the teacher's desk front and then there's a blackboard or a whiteboard or whatever and maybe the the windows are along here what would happen if you were to draw this classroom and make a little bit more space over here not a lot of room for a mobility device to get into this classroom very very close together I mean if we were to add the chairs and think about how you would draw a chair from looking at it above. I'm just drawing it with like this little curve and a back um, and then drawing it over and over again. But maybe the chairs in your classroom don't look like this. And so how would you draw a chair from a bird's eye view? I just got encouraged to do this because I was just thinking about if there was somebody um, in a mobility device or a wheelchair, um, when you've got all the chairs like this can be really, really hard to navigate around a space. Uh, and I just wanted to show how it would be really, really difficult, how it'd be really cramped and people wouldn't necessarily be able to get in and around there. So that was just a thought that I had, which took me on uh, drawing something new. And that's, that's what Explores is all about. Every time you have an idea or you have a question, um, if you ask yourself, what happens if I you should check it out. You should go ahead and try and see what happens when you draw something new. And I wanted to see what would happen if I added chairs behind each one of these desks. Now what I'm asking you is what would happen if you tried to draw this same classroom, but not from a bird's eye view, from looking at it at the side as if you had walked into the classroom or um, rolled into the classroom, um, and you came into the back and you're standing right here. Could you map this space? Could you draw this space not as a bird's eye view? And what information would you lose? And what information would you gain? What would you be able to see that you can't see when you look at it as a bird's eye view? And what information can you see when you're not looking at a bird's eye view? If you joined me last week when we were looking at fantasy worlds, what I, what I was talking about um, when it came to maps and when we're translating information um, onto a page, maps are a simplification. They are a, they are, um, a representation that has less detail. And that's on purpose because we can't fit every little thing. Maybe this desk is where Ethan sits and Ethan usually has um, a thermos and always keeps their notebook on the page and always puts their backpack on the side of the page. And maybe Paula over here, Paula always has a really cool pencil case that they keep at the top of their desk uh, and they have a couple of stickers on their desk. I hope that was allowed in, in uh, Paula's class. And they also keep their, um, their backpack there. And so I, I put all this information, I'm just going to continue to do that, I put all this information on each one of the desks, and all of a sudden it becomes harder to focus on what's actually available, the information that I can take from this space, because there's so many lines and there's so much clutter, and I don't actually need to know that Paula has stickers on their desk or that Henry has a bunch of scratches on their desk and uh, Josephine always has a bag but also usually puts bag over here and likes to bring in uh, bags of shopping oh it has their gym bag um, and is also a skater so usually their um, their skates are back there right this information if if you're showing it to somebody else later might go well what are these squiggles over here? And so while it was really clear before that what you were mapping was just the orientation or placement of the desks, as soon as you have all these questions or all these extra marks, the person who didn't draw your map then needs to try and decipher or read or understand 
all the extra information that you put there. So maps are really about being simple so that you can get your goal or the details that you want or need somebody to have. Um, so they might not be super accurate and that's okay. So for this, my bird's eye of my space, I put this, this kind of weird line over here with a circle because I have this big light um, that illuminates my art space. So this is my art space over here. I got a cork board um, and I've got a chair. There we go. Um, and so as I was thinking, without, without even stopping, I automatically put my chair and my cork board as I thought about this area because those were details that I needed to have in this space because they take up space. Uh, maybe I want to direct somebody to my cork board. Um, this chair is always here, and so this is a blocked space. And so those details are important without making it so cluttered. I don't need to put my, my little uh, host here. Oh, I didn't even notice when this fell over. Um, or my uh, sandwich board, or my viewfinder, or my box of crayons. I don't need to put all that information in there. I just need to show that this is the space that my art table usually is at, and my chair is always there because it's blocking it, and that this light takes up space so it makes it hard for you to walk by here, um, and that's it. Really simple. That's what I need to have in the space. And so if you were to draw your space again, all over again, what would you take out and what would you leave in? What did you add because you thought about it because it's a space that you were looking at and you thought, oh, nope, that's a detail that I want to draw. And then the next time you draw it, go, well, what's the detail that I need to have here? What are details I don't really need to have here? And somebody could still understand that that's that space over there, that that's where the cupboards are. Okay, lots of things that we could try and consider when we're mapping our own space. And if you want to keep just mapping your space you want to keep just coloring your space, go for it. You don't have to continue on to this next part. What I'm going to do now is that now that we have this space here, what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to build a grid over top of this. Um, and then, then I can define specific areas. And so for a grid, a grid is usually um, something, so it's a, an area that is divided into smaller equal sections, right? And so you can have grid paper. We did, a, we did an Explorers where we were doing nothing but grids. And so for this, what I'm gonna do is if I had a viewfinder that had my string on it, I could put it over top of areas and really quickly define spaces without having to draw on my, on my map. And I could just, I could orient it. There you go. Check it out. And so this could be one space. This could be another space, right? And use my viewfinder to divide up the space using, using this. I'm going to actually just draw on top of my area because this isn't for keeps. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily um, need to be able to move my grid around. But if you wanted to keep your grid nice and clean and you just wanted to use your viewfinder, you absolutely could. If you're still trying to answer my question, what would happen if you drew um, a classroom or drew your space looking at it at the side, you can keep doing that for sure. Um, I'm just going to continue going on with uh, mapping the space. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just dividing my space in half because we want to try and create a grid that is made up of equal uh, divisions. So again, I'm going to divide my space in quarters. And now with eights, draw through my piece of paper that I drew over top of. There we go. Yep. And then there. All right, so there's my grid. Remember how I was talking about before about the, uh, the, the chore map? Well, what you could do now is depending on the number of people that you have in your space or who are available to do the chores, maybe it's your classroom 
And so you could write down all the people in your class. And depending on the number of squares that you did, you could do a grid that, so let's say you had 28 people in your class, you could divide your space up into 28 different sections. And then that would be the section that they would have to do. I think this is 24. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nope, that's 32. Let's say there's 32 people in your class. And so uh, 32 uh, would mean that, um, who were some of the students I was saying before? So Paula, I think I said an Ethan. Um, I can't remember the other student names that I came up with before, but everybody gets a different spot. And so for the chores, that could be if somebody had the space where the, ger the class gerbil was, well then, uh, if this is where Ethan is, then, oh sorry, Ethan is, then Ethan for this week um, has to deal with the gerbil. You could also take the classroom and you could uh, put a code on top of it where you go, uh, maybe you could number it one, two, three, four, five, or you could go A, B, C, D, or you could do something more fun where you could be triangle, circle, square, pineapple, uh, I don't know, airplane. <laughs> <laughs> that one might be really hard, but really fun for your whole class to come up with uh, different symbols for each of the sections. And then each week you could change it. So then you make your list of triangle, circle, square, pineapple. It's kind of more of a strawberry, but that's okay. <laughs> Plain. And then, uh, so for week one, you've got Ethan... Paula, Nat, um, Orlo, and um, Kavinder. And so you've got each one of the uh, different classmates. It goes all the way down to 32. And then in week two, then you can change it. So Kavinder is square, then it's Nat. Then it's Orlo, then it's Paula, then it's Ethan. And so each week, everybody would get a different section of the class um, to take care of. And so whether that's cleaning it up or making sure that it's stocked, taking care of the animals, um, taking care of the students in that space. So if this was your classroom over here, right, and you did the same thing where you had your grid, Maybe, um, even though this isn't your desk, maybe this is Ethan's desk, you get to then check in with Ethan this week and ask Ethan how he's feeling. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's a chart that maps caring or a buddy system. And you can go, hey, Ethan, how are you feeling this week? And you know that uh, you, if you had a fire drill um, or when you were going from class to class, you would know to be able to, or you would know who you were responsible for to check in and make sure that they were doing okay or they got where they need to, to go and you could switch it, switch it up all the time. So this is just one way that you could map up a real space um, and use a grid, but it could also, so uh, the, the chart, but you could also play a game where, remember how I said, uh, if you were hiding chocolate eggs, you could make a, here, I'm gonna change a different color because we've already got this for the grid. And you could use it for multiple reasons, right? Just because you used it for the chore wheel doesn't mean that you couldn't take a picture of it or print it out or draw it again and use it for multiple reasons. So whether that's um, for like the, the hiding of the eggs, like I said, um, or you're gonna play hide and seek. So you could never hide um, in the same place twice. Um, for different areas uh, in the apartment um, or the classroom that you are going to, uh, that you're allowed to go into, um, but that you have to challenge yourself to not go into some spaces. So there's lots of reasons why you could grid out um, and use a map of a real life space um, to do some cool and interesting things. Okay, where are all the places that I hid my, my eggs? Maybe a couple in the cupboard two on the windowsill, 
one on top of the TV and one on my chair. And so then you go, okay, everybody go and find eggs. And you get to the end of the day and people come back and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, and people have only found 11 of the eggs. Then you can walk with everybody and go, did everybody find the one in the tub? Yes. Did everybody find the two in the cupboard? Oh, no, they only found one. And there's the one that was missing. And then you don't miss out on any chocolate, <laughs> which, which can be important to a lot of people. Okay. So one last thing um, before, we, before we wrap up week two is that um, a grid like this could also be a really fun game if you wanted, if it wasn't just even eggs, but if it was you, you, you did this with a friend or another grown up or another person where you both had the same map. And if you've ever played, so there's a, there's a pretty famous game here. I'm going to do this in black. It's a pretty famous game where um, you use a grid and people hide um, boats on this grid. And then what happens is that you've both got your maps and you've both got your hidden, you've got your hidden boats on it. And there's a, a, a screen that, that hides the information from each other. And then you get to guess based on the grid. And so rather than you having to say, uh, do you have a boat that is hidden in uh, the upper left hand corner, maybe 30 centimeters uh, from the middle, <laughs> that, that could be really hard. But a grid is something that you might both have um, in common. And so it's really easy for you to say um, in the upper left hand grid or A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And instead, you can go in grid C6, did you hide a boat? And if you had hidden your boat there, you would go, yes, I, you, you found one of my boats. So if we're mapping our real space though, and here I did the grid in black this time, so I'm gonna draw all my details in green, and I'm gonna copy really quickly what I drew over here. So I got my washing machine, and I got my There we go, we've got our washroom, there's the, there's the tub, the toilet, the sink, and then the door, and that's the wall that comes out. And that's the stove, that's my sink, that's my refrigerator, and then I have kitchen island, and then I've got my stairs, yeah. This can be a fun exercise as well. I have to go kind of slow because I'm trying to trace, but with the grid, I can use the grid to go, oh, yep, so this space goes halfway through my space here, so that's going to be easy for me to copy because I have a reference and I know where Things, uh, things are in relation to the grid. This is my clothes hook, and then my door. There we go. Two spaces, and I have a window over here, window over here, and then all of my art supplies. table, lamp, and corkboard. Oh, and then my couch. There we go. All right, there we go. And so by using the grid, even though my grid is bigger, I was able to approximately get the same placement of where everything was, and so that I've got the same grid. And now I'm going to go A, B, e, C, D. One, two, three, or, oops, there goes my washroom. It's coming with me. It's because I got a little piece of tape on this scrap piece of paper at the back of this envelope there. Uh, four, sorry, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Okay, so then what you could do is you could hide 
from um, from each other where what your grid is so your friend has or your um, parent or guardian or whoever you're you're playing with they have their their map um, and you have one map and so let's say uh, let's say you're you're playing with a sibling and uh, what you're going to do is you are going to you're going to go okay I have um, I hid and this is just for fantasy. This is just for fun. So we didn't actually hide something. We've got a map. We can get to play with it. And you could take pieces, right? You don't even have to draw it on the map. You could just make some markers. So one person is playing O's and one person is playing X's. We've got the same number each. You could draw whatever you want. So if for you, um, maybe you don't want to play with X's and O's. You want to play with happy faces um, and uh, crying faces. Or you want to draw um, coins or whatever. Whatever you want to hide on your space. And so it's like a game where your sibling goes through and they hide, they hide something in the stove and they hide something in this closet and they hide something in the art shelf and then you hide something uh, under the stairs and on the couch and maybe you don't you don't realize it but you both put something on the uh, on the stove and so now what you get to do remember this is hidden so you can't see your siblings um, page and your sibling can't see your page and then you can go okay so I'm gonna have taken an imaginary walk through this space and I'm gonna go look in the closet in a2 did you hide circles in closet A2? And you look through and you go, oh, nope, I didn't hide any circles in A2. And then you get to laugh because hey, it was really close. You didn't hide it in this closet. You hid it in the closet that was in A3. But they don't know that, and so you get to keep playing. And then your sibling goes, okay, um, did you hide something on the couch uh, at B7? And then you go, what? How did you know? And then you can take your check mark and go, yep, I found the first one. And maybe make a mark and go, yep, I got one. One out of three. And then you go back and forth, back and forth. And then you've made yourself a game that you can play with your real space. You could play it with different, uh, different X's. You play with your friends and you can have different names um, as if you were playing hide and seek and you get to hide your hide your friends in different places and then um, the other person has to play being it and go find the spaces on the map. So this week we explored mapping a real space and the things that we can do with it. It doesn't just have to be for wayfaring. It can be for fun. It can be for planning a space. It can be for practicing, um, drawing things spatially in relation to each other. There are lots of ways that you can explore maps. And again, this week, I only explored uh, a very small portion. So you can go back and you can check out week one. Again, that's on our um, artstarts.com slash explores dash online page on our Facebook videos or on YouTube. And I will be back next week exploring our, our last week, uh, week three of exploring maps and I can't wait to do that with you today or sorry next week um so like all weeks I'm gonna leave my video running just a little bit longer while I clean up because we always like to practice uh respect for our space and everything that we did today was just on scrap paper because nothing is for keeps so I encourage you to put it all away into the recycling bin and then try making something new another day all right I'll see you next week thanks so much